sadly, many individuals prefer to assert their dominance over others not through intellect, but through physical strength. They disregard boundaries. My wife, in her view, found an incredible lover who has devastated my life, but I am not ready to walk away easily. Something seemed off. Dan noticed his neighbor's garage, the door was ajar, and trash cans were scattered on the driveway. It was unusual for Kyle to leave his doors open. Raccoons were a frequent nuisance in this neighborhood. Dan approached and saw the newspaper lying on the lawn. This was peculiar, Kyle, who ran every morning, always collected his paper. He also never left the front door open. Kyle worked as a theatrical tech designer, often involved in sound or lighting projects in his home studio. These projects frequently demanded silence or darkness, so Kyle had gotten into the habit of keeping the house securely locked unless he or G were in the yard, especially because of the raccoons from the woods behind their property. Dan knocked on the frame of the open door and called inside to see if anyone was home. Just as he was about to call out again, he saw Kyle lying on the floor in the doorway to his studio. A small pool of blood had formed beneath Kyle's head, his face looked battered, his arm bent at a grotesque angle, and there were bruises everywhere not covered by clothing. Kyle had been beaten in his own home and left without aid. Dan quickly dialed 911 on his cell and called out for G. He managed to restrain the adrenaline pumping through his veins long enough to give the 911 operator all the information he could, then raced from room to room to ensure she wasn't also lying beaten in another room needing his help. She wasn't there. Dan had barely completed his sweep of the house when a police car pulled up in front, lights flashing. An ambulance followed closely, and while the EMT crew attended to Kyle, the police questioned Dan about what he had found. As Kyle was rushed to the emergency room, one question reverberated in everyone's mind, where was G? Fade to black. Kyle and G met in college, both enrolled in theater programs at drama schools in New York, situated in one of the world's most vibrant theater communities. G was training to be an actress, mastering the art of creating the illusion of a story on stage though. She was talented but struggled with taking direction and much preferred giving it. Her teachers noticed her creativity and began grooming her for a career as a director or in theater management. Kyle, on the other hand, was captivated by the backstage magic of theater. Instead of creating illusions as an actor, he crafted different realities through sound, lighting effects, and set designs, making it easier for the audience to believe in the actor's performances. Kyle's brilliance was immediately recognized. He was a rare talent who comprehended all aspects of technical theater, feeling equally at ease designing lighting as he did with a sound plot. They met during a summer stock project in Connecticut right after their junior year. Chi was hired as the stage manager by her mentor and professor, who was directing two of the four summer productions. Kyle had worked there for the previous two summers as a house electrician, but that year he was promoted to assistant lighting director and had the chance to design one of the shows. As they worked closely together, they were instantly drawn to each other. This project would be the first of many they would do together, both as students and later in their professional careers. Chi was a slender, graceful presence with a captivating smile and deep brown eyes. She had a perfectly balanced figure with long, tanned legs often shown off by the shorts she wore. Her tops were conservative enough to be polite but hinted at a playful side. Kyle was strikingly handsome. An avid runner, he believed his best ideas came during his morning runs, which helped clear his mind of daily distractions. He looked like he worked out regularly, but he stayed fit from the physical demands of his job, which involved a lot of lifting and climbing. He was confident that continuing to do the hands-on work of lighting design would keep him in shape for life. For two weeks, they had been shouting instructions to each other from opposite ends of the theater, focusing lights positioning special effects speakers, and coordinating cues before they finally got a chance to sit together. They needed to program the cues into the light board, and as they worked side by side, they grew increasingly friendly. When they finished, G leaned over, kissed Kyle on the cheek, and told him how much she enjoyed working with him and how he made her job something she looked forward to every day. Kyle responded with a kiss, but not on the cheek. She reciprocated, and their little tete-a-tete -tete in the control booth quickly turned passionate. 
Just then, the theater door below opened and slammed as the director entered, calling up to them, Kyle, gee, are you finished yet? We need to lock up. They quickly straightened up and descended from the booth. All done, and you're going to love it, G said, hurrying down the stairs ahead of Kyle, determined to hide their brief romantic interlude. They started seeking ways to spend time together, but as the production got underway, their time became scarce. G commuted daily with her professor from her apartment in the city, while Kyle stayed at his home, a short drive in the opposite direction. One evening, G's professor was not attending the show, opting instead to stay in the city to celebrate his daughter's birthday. G, left in charge, had nowhere to stay. Kyle offered her the guest room at his house. With his parents away at the Cape for the summer, the house had plenty of space. G was thrilled. She didn't think they would need much space, one bed would be enough. It was late when they arrived at Kyle's house. Jeannie had fallen asleep in the car, and Kyle didn't want to take advantage of her exhaustion. She was becoming very special to him, different from the shallow girls he had met at college parties or post-show theater gatherings. So, when they reached his home, he acted the perfect gentleman and host. He took her to the room he intended for her to sleep in, made sure she was settled, and then quietly retreated to his own room for a much-needed rest. There would be time to spend together the next day. He was vaguely aware that the door to his room had opened and someone had joined him in bed. Soft, graceful arms wrapped around him, and the sweetest kiss he had ever experienced was imprinted on his lips. Their bodies touched under the sheets as they passionately kissed and explored each other's bodies, making love for the first time. Kyle! Kyle! Call Dr. Kenton, he's waking up. Kyle's vision blurred as he saw the bright fluorescent light of the hospital room after the operation. It was difficult for him to concentrate, and he was completely confused. Only one eye seemed to be working. He tried to stand up but found himself restrained and immediately began to struggle with the restraints. Easy, easy, Kyle. You've had a hard time, but we'll get through this. Don't resist us, we are on your side. He leaned back on the headboard and looked at the postoperative nurse who was talking to him. Dr. Kenton was due to arrive soon to explain everything. What's wrong with my eye? Kyle asked, alarmed that his eye was tightly bandaged. It was very painful. We have to wait and let the doctor talk to you. Calm down, he'll be here soon. Indeed, a doctor arrived soon after. He examined Kyle and explained the reasons for his injuries. Kyle had been beaten up. His eye was bandaged because he had received a serious blow. As a result of the blow, he suffered a severe concussion. The doctors were relieved to see that he was still in control of his speech. Kyle's arm was seriously injured and was in a cast. If a neighbor had found him an hour later, he would not have survived. He had a broken nose and several ribs. He had been unconscious for two days since he was discovered and they were still trying to determine the time of his attack to estimate how long he had been unattended. I don't remember any attack, Kyle said. The doctor frowned and began questioning Kyle. When he realized that Kyle couldn't remember any of the events from the weekend or the Friday before, he started asking more general questions. By the end of their session, Dr. Kenton understood that Kyle couldn't recall anything that had happened since his freshman year before he met Jeannie. The attack had left Kyle with severe memory loss, and only time would reveal if and when his memories might return. Detective Porter, who was assigned to investigate Kyle's case, was visibly troubled. His timeline of the events leading up to the attack hit a dead end last Friday when Kyle had deactivated the home security system. Where had Jeannie been all this time? Senior year had been a blur. Kyle saw Jeannie regularly, and their love grew daily. By the end of the year, both of their careers were well established. Kyle was working as a designer for several small suburban houses and frequently backstage at downtown theaters for renowned designers. Jeannie secured a job backstage at one of the major opera companies at Lincoln Center, a steady position with great benefits. They shared a small apartment near her theater and enjoyed the vibrant performing arts scene in the city. He remembered the tender moments they shared. 
she was a stylish decorator and an expert shopper, transforming their apartment into a chic gathering spot for their friends. He was a gourmet cook, and whether preparing dinner for themselves, for guests, or just a candlelit meal for the two of them, he always delighted her with his delicious dishes. In bed, she rolled her eyes too, he knew how to make her really enjoy herself. Kyle woke up in a cold sweat, still lying in a hospital bed. Jenny, how did Jenny fit into his life now? He had been told about his amnesia and how slowly his memory could return. They warned him that such episodes would happen from time to time, and he would almost relive his life when the oldest memories surfaced. He wasn't prepared for how vivid the dreams were and how much he was worried about making love earlier today. Kyle remembered Jenny only as a girl he knew from the summer club, and now the memories of their life together came flooding back to him. He couldn't wait to remember how she had fit into his life during the years that the concussion had taken away from him. Where was Jenny now? Over the next few days, memories of their early life seeped back into his mind. Her career growth led her to the position of director of photography in a very active suburban theater where performances and concerts took place. This company appreciated Kyle's work and often hired him. The couple had good financial affairs and decided to get married. He clearly remembered the wedding now, the ceremony in the small church came back to him in all its details. He could hear the small organ playing Bach and smell the distinct scent of wax candles burning on the altar. His eyes filled with tears at the sight of the smiling bride coming toward him. He was able to taste delicious dishes in a small Greek restaurant where they had their wedding feast. They danced and hugged their family and friends as they headed to the small hotel where they were to spend their wedding night. It was wonderful. That night, they made love, and when they finished, they looked into each other's eyes for hours, dreaming of a long life and old age together. They woke up in the morning the same way they fell asleep, face to face, looking into each other's eyes. Finally, she snuggled closer to him, wrapping her leg around his thigh. He responded to her touch, and soon they were at it again. Kyle woke up in a hospital bed once more, covered in cold sweat. He still couldn't stay awake for long, but his dreams involving Jenny always made him uneasy. Why did he always wake up so scared after these dreams? Was he still married to Jenny? If so, where was she? He asked the nurse if they had any information about him. I can't do that, she replied. I don't know enough about you to fill in the blanks. I can help you remember, but if I say something wrong, it can make the situation worse. Unfortunately, due to your concussion and the condition of your eye, we need you to be calm. Stress is unacceptable right now. His friend Dr. Kenton came during his evening rounds. He was glad to see that Kyle remembered events right up to his wedding, but there was still a 15-year gap in his memory. Dr. Kenton agreed to provide Kyle with some information on the condition that he would remain calm. You're still married to Jenny, according to the neighbor. Who found you an SA? Your life is still going well, you are working as a freelance theater designer, and you have a beautiful house very close to this hospital. You and your wife didn't have children, but you are the quintessential happy couple embodying the American dream. The doctor proceeded to explain Kyle's injuries once more, now that Kyle appeared more awake and aware. They were confident he would fully recover from everything. The doctor delved into a detailed medical explanation of each injury, but Kyle found himself tuning out, unable to hear the answers to the questions he wanted to ask. His mind was preoccupied. Where's G? Meanwhile, G reclined on the dock by the lake. The water felt refreshing against her hand as it dangled over the edge. Above her, clouds drifted slowly across the hills that flanked the lake. Here she was in a different world, far from the city's hustle and bustle, away from the constant demands of temperamental actors and diva musicians who graced her stage. She was also distant from Kyle. She wasn't entirely sure how to feel about that realization. She knew she still loved Kyle, but he was consumed by work. He never made time to escape, and his rigid schedule made her feel like their time together wasn't a priority. This little getaway with Steve was exactly what she needed. What kind of power did Kyle really have over her? Divorce him? Oh well. 
She looked at Steve, who was standing on the shore with his back to her, lifting dumbbells in the sunlight to finish his morning workout. His back bulged with muscles, and his large arms glistened with sweat. Steve was a college football star and played in the NFL for several seasons until he suffered a knee injury. He now owned a chain of local fitness clubs and maintained his slim and muscular figure. He managed his money wisely by hiring a manager who invested his NFL earnings in real estate. What difference did it make if he knew nothing about anything but money? He couldn't discuss anything other than football and bodybuilding, but when he held her close, it felt like a scene from a love affair. She melted when he picked her up in his arms and carried her to bed. Come on, Kyle, she thought. File for divorce. We don't have kids who can make things difficult, and just look what I'll win, I'm going to marry Mr. Universe. I'm going to be Mrs. Universe. I would trade a rundown movie theater for a gym where I could work out whenever I wanted or admire bodybuilders and Lycra all day long. I can't wait for his call. After confronting them at the house last Friday as they were leaving, she half expected a process server to track her down here with divorce papers. She checked her cell phone for the hundredth time that day just to ensure it was working and ready for his call. The battery was fully charged, there was a strong signal thanks to the cell tower on the hill, and the ringer was on loud. But Kyle hadn't called. They hadn't even called from work, despite her arranging this vacation week months ago. A week had passed since Kyle had pleaded with her not to go with Steve. How could someone beg for attention one moment and then not call for a whole week? Yet here it was Friday, and still nothing from Kyle. She sat up on the dock, her body glowing from a week of sunning and evenings spent touring wineries and taverns. She adored the Finger Lakes. The evening sun cast a beautiful glow over everything. Why had Kyle always insisted on vacationing at the cottage on the Cape? No crowds here, no bustling beaches, just the tranquil solitude of the woods. Kyle dominated her thoughts again. Why hadn't he called? It was so unlike him. She sat up and dialed her home number. The voicemail picked up, aggravating her with the sound of her own recorded voice. She left a message in Kyle's mailbox saying. She'd be home early Sunday, and they could talk then. After hanging up, she sat thoughtfully with the phone in her hand. Maybe there wouldn't be a divorce after all. Maybe Kyle would give up and ask her to come home. Yes, he would improve, he cooked, cleaned, and treated her like a goddess. Ah, Kyle, the cuckold, fulfilled all her whims while she frolicked with her stallion, Steve. Kyle should have been home. If he was angry, why hadn't he called? And if he wasn't angry, what was he feeling? She knew he didn't have a show this weekend. He wasn't home, hadn't called in a week, and hadn't even sent a text. This was all very strange. He was denying her the argument she had been rehearsing in her mind since she left. She craved that fight, yearned to see his passion, but he wasn't giving her even that. She called home again, this time entering the code to her personal message box instead of the general family box. It was full. There were frantic calls from neighbors, from Kyle's mom, and, most alarmingly, several from Detective Porter. Apparently, Kyle had been badly injured, and his injury had caught the attention of the police. Oh my, her mind raced, but eventually, it returned to the last time she saw Kyle. Kyle had knelt on the floor, begging her not to go. He clung to her back, telling her nothing could be so bad that she'd leave like this without even telling him anything. She had expected a more dignified reaction and saw this display as beneath him. Honestly, I don't know how you can expect me to respect you as a man. Get up and face facts. You don't treat me like I'm important, Steve does. You raise lights high into position on a pipe, and Steve lifts me into bed with arms so strong they leave me breathless. You complain that I don't make love passionately to you anymore. Anyway, so what will you be missing? I need a week away. I need a vacation, not at the Cape. I need to know how another man can make me feel, how it feels to be wanted. She regarded him with contempt as he leaned back. Steve stood chuckling softly in the doorway. It made her smile, too. Man up. Let me go. If he doesn't meet expectations, 
I'll return next week, and we can discuss it. Kyle released the suitcase. If you leave, everything will change. We can't return to how things were. What makes you think how things were was so great anyway, she retorted, grabbing her bag and exiting through the door. I'll join you shortly, Steve remarked. I just have a few words for this little coward. As Jenny sauntered towards the car, Steve approached Kyle, who was sitting dejectedly in the hallway. Steve's big hand punched him in the back of the head. The attack was brief but unremarkable. Kyle lost consciousness after the first blow and did not know that Steve was kicking him in the stomach or punching him. Without closing the door, Steve got into the car with Jenny and headed north to the lake. Jenny smiled all the way, remembering her meeting with Steve last winter. While Kyle always maintained his physical fitness through running and work, she gained weight and felt older than her husband despite being the same age. When she arrived at Steve's gym, where? He became her personal trainer. She remembered their first meeting in the hot tub and the night they spent together. It was unlike anything she had experienced with Kyle. Despite the fact that Steve was less gifted, his energy and assertiveness in bed made him a fierce lover. Kyle went to Chicago for a week to watch the band on tour, performing his last show. On the first evening of his absence, he gently called Jenny, expressing how much he missed her. Kyle had no idea that Steve was closely involved with Jenny, and he couldn't imagine they finished just as Kyle ended his phone conversation with a gentle I love you. Jenny, overcome with passion, reciprocated these words, although her heart was turned to Steve, not to Kyle. For a week, she indulged in all sorts of pleasures with Steve until, on Sunday, Kyle returned home from his trip completely exhausted. Jenny woke up from her sleep, overcome with anxiety. She was worried about Kyle, knowing that deep down she still loved him. Her anxiety increased after a message from Detective Porter about Kyle's attack. It seemed ominous, suggesting that she should have known about it by now. She glanced at Steve, towering over her and finishing his workout by pulling himself up on a nearby branch. Steve, what did you mean when you said it was taken care of, she asked. Steve looked up, defeated. What do you mean? Last Friday at my place, when we left and you came out after me, you said it was taken care of. What did you mean by that? Oh, you know, just asserting dominance. Had to show him who's boss. There's only one alpha in any group, and I'm staking my claim as yours. Steve, what did you do? I punched him, roughed him up a bit. No big deal, really. Steve, the police left a message. Kyle's badly hurt, not by my hand. Steve lied. He was conscious when I left. Maybe he got into trouble later or someone else got to him. We need to go back. No way, he replied. We have two more days of relaxing and partying ahead. Steve, this is serious. Kyle is seriously injured, and if he shows up beaten and we're nowhere to be found, it'll look bad. You want to risk two nights of fun for potential jail time? She hurried inside, packed their bags, and returned. Steve had already loaded his essentials and dumbbells into the car. All right, maybe you're right, he conceded. Let's get out of here. They tossed the bags in the trunk, locked up, and sped south. Fade to black. Kyle's bandages were taken off on Friday morning, and his body was gradually recovering from the trauma and anesthesia effects. He was alert and engaging with the nurses, even flirting with them. Detective Porter, frustrated by the lack of progress in the police interviews, continued to feel unsettled. Kyle was glad to recall his happy life with Jenny, his work on recent shows and a significant project involving his studio's recording equipment and sound effects. However, memories of intense pain lingered, somehow connected to his head pain, but he couldn't quite grasp the details. He slept peacefully Friday night, anticipating going home Saturday. Just as Kyle drifted off, Jenny returned home to find the house dark. Steve helped her with her bag, both shocked to find a notice on the door confirming it had been a crime scene, now cleared for re-entry. Inside, Jenny was horrified to see a large dry blood stain in the hallway where Kyle had been found. She turned to Steve. Just a punch in the nose, right?
Steve paled in his anger. He may have gone too far. If Kyle was left critically injured without help, he could face serious charges beyond simple assault. His mind raced for an explanation, realizing he had acted impulsively, not with the precision of a clear thinker. We can't tell the police I hit him, Steve said. We need to say. I left first, took your bag to the car, and he was fine with that. When you left, this is really bad, Steve, really bad. Gee, stick to the story, and we'll be fine. We might look bad for leaving him, but they can't blame us for anything. Gee was shocked I was in the car. If anything happens, it's on you, not me. Leaving Kyle is one thing, going to jail for hurting him is another. You were with me, babe. You heard me say he was okay. You're involved in this. I might not be the brightest, but I know what an accomplice is. She thought it over and realized Steve was right, they couldn't explain leaving Kyle unless they claimed he was okay, leaving open the possibility that someone else hurt him. How did she get tangled up in this? She agreed with Steve, and they got their story straight. By the time they finished, it was almost midnight. She called Detective Porter, who said he'd meet them at the station right away. This was urgent and couldn't wait until morning. She initially wanted to go straight to the hospital, but Detective Porter was adamant. He assured her that Kyle's medical condition was stable now and that he needed rest. He pointed out that G hadn't rushed to Kyle's side when he was critically ill and that tonight she had even gone home instead of going directly to the hospital. Porter argued that disturbing Kyle's much-needed rest was unnecessary at this point. There were unanswered questions that needed to be addressed. G didn't reply until Porter offered to send a patrolman to pick her up and drive her. Reluctantly, she and Steve got into the car and headed to the police station. They were interrogated separately, sticking to a rehearsed story and often claiming ignorance with I don't know. They admitted to being at the house and seeing Kyle, acknowledging he was extremely upset when they left but physically unharmed. Porter remained skeptical but lacked evidence to challenge their account. Aware that Kyle was being discharged from the hospital soon, he decided to detain Steve and G until Kyle was settled so he could warn him about his wife's return. Perhaps time in custody would make one of them crack and reveal the truth. Porter arrived as Dan, Kyle's neighbor, brought him home. Kyle stepped out cautiously, still feeling the effects of his recent brutal attack. Gesturing Porter inside, Kyle led him into a beautifully tidy house where the scent of something delicious filled the air. Earlier, Dan's wife Kim had cleaned up the hallway, creating a welcoming atmosphere. Kim emerged from the kitchen with a warm smile, inviting everyone to the table for a home-cooked meal to celebrate Kyle's return. Despite Kyle's gratitude for Kim's efforts, especially in clearing away reminders of the incident, he felt uneasy being back home. His memory gaps from the week leading up to the attack frustrated him. After dinner, Kim and Dan tidied up and bid farewell. As they left, they had coordinated with neighbors to check in on Kyle regularly over the weekend, reassuring him to call if he needed anything. As they departed, Detective Porter spoke to Kyle, noting seriously, she'll be home soon. I know she was already here, Kyle replied, nodding towards G's bag near the door. I held on to them today just to ensure everything's set for your meeting. He'll likely be with her, Porter added. I'm prepared, Kyle affirmed. Detective Porter observed the determination in Kyle's eyes and suggested. I want to show you something. Leading Porter to his studio, Kyle revealed an impressive array of sound and imaging equipment, directing him to a computer workstation connected to a large mixing board. This is my primary recording setup. I have a variety of intriguing files stored here, some of which I have forgotten about until just recently. For the past day or two, I've been trying to recall something specific about a project I was working on but couldn't quite remember. When Dan and Kim left, it triggered a memory of another couple leaving the house, the same couple who departed just before I was attacked last Friday. It's possible that I had been recording something when they visited and maybe forgot to turn off the recorder. There could be an audio file here that would clarify things for you. In case something happens to me, it's possible that I recorded everything from the moment Jeff and Steve left until the recording reached its preset limit of 12 hours. I should bring this to our lab. I'd prefer if you didn't. 
I'd rather handle my own problems, Detective Porter said thoughtfully. He wasn't suspicious, he understood that Kyle's intention was to retaliate against Steve for the beating he had received last week. Kyle, I enjoy watching a good fight as much as anyone, but unfortunately, I'd have to arrest everyone involved, including any witnesses. I also appreciate seeing an underdog come back strong and reclaim what they've lost. Steve is a big guy and clearly spends a lot of time at the gym. It won't matter. Well, what I don't know won't hurt me. Just give yourself some more time to recover. Kyle nodded. Detective Porter wished him well and ensured Kyle had his phone number saved in his speed dial. Fade to black. Steve brought Jeff home from the county lockup that evening. Her hair was messy, and her clothes were rumpled. They entered the house together, but Steve stayed by the door while she ventured alone into the living room. Hi, she murmured. Kyle just stared at her, his face unreadable. I heard you were injured, so I came home early. Inside, Kyle wanted desperately to leap up and confront her about her pretended concern for cutting short a trip she shouldn't have taken to have an affair he couldn't understand or forgive. Outwardly, though, he remained composed. That's correct. She was taken aback by his lack of emotion after his dramatic plea for her to stay, including tears and clinging to her back. She had anticipated a stronger reaction. Are you all right now? I'll recover. We need to talk. No, we don't. We already talked last week. Kyle, we can't just ignore this. We have to discuss it. I need to know what's going to happen. Expect us to separate and divorce. Expect me to leave and never return. Expect me to treat you with respect like any other person deserves, but without the love and care I felt for you just a week ago. Well, some of it unfolded as she had anticipated, but she hadn't foreseen his demeanor being so composed. Planning to stay a few more days, she intended to depart once she had organized her affairs. After setting her bag down, she turned to take a seat. I mentioned you're leaving, she said, glancing at him with a puzzled expression. I mean right now, leave. I don't think you understand the situation. I might have upset you, and I might have initiated the end of our marriage, but I haven't relinquished my rights to this house or my belongings. I'll move into the guest room, but I'm staying here until I gather my things and find a new place to live. Before she could continue her outburst, Kyle pressed a button on the remote control he had in his hand. The stereo system installed in the house instantly came to life, playing a recording of the events from last Friday. It was clear as day, she could be heard sarcastically making fun of Kyle, announcing her intention to go on vacation with another man, and mocking Kyle for not being able to stop her. Steve's laughter echoed in the background as she bragged about spending time with him and making unequivocal promises. Kyle's desperate pleas for reconciliation, his pathetic attempts to hold on to her back, and the loud clatter of her heels, as she left, were captured after she slammed the door. It opened briefly, and Jenny called out to Steve. His response was a warning to Kyle not to interfere, followed by the disgusting sounds of a physical fight. Steve grumbled as he attacked Kyle, making chilling threats about what he planned to do to both Kyle and Jenny. As Steve left, he said his last goodbye, your mind is as broken as your fragile heart. Right now, just lie down and think for an hour or two. Eventually, you'll realize she needs a strong man to satisfy her, but she'll come back to you when she sees that a tough guy like him can't stay with anyone for long. Kyle looked at Jenny, who was stunned. Steve appeared in the doorway, frowning at Kyle. You treacherous little coward. Kyle silenced him by holding up a finger. Porter doesn't have a record, but he can get one if I ask. I don't want him to send you to jail. I want a rematch. Jenny looked scared. Steve smiled broadly. Let's make a bet. You both have to agree, but on different terms, otherwise, there will be no deal and Porter will receive the audio file via email in ten minutes. In six weeks, as soon as the cast is removed and the ribs heal, you're not going to win. Steve shook his head. I couldn't win after your sneaky attack last week. This time, we will fight fairly. Don't sneak up from behind to hit an unsuspecting victim. You're a coward. 
you'll see me coming, just like I saw you lying unconscious last week. Do you think you can win on these terms, hand to hand, like man to man, without a weapon? You're in trouble. We'll see, Kyle said. Steve reconsidered his options. He wasn't willing to risk such substantial assets. He owned the gym and the entire building it was housed in, including several lucrative office spaces that made it a cash cow. His luxurious apartment occupied the building's top floor, offering breathtaking views of Long Island Sound. Despite these comforts, Steve doubted this challenger could match a seasoned lifter like himself. Sure, David had conquered Goliath, but he had a sling. Put all your gems on the line, Steve hesitated, contemplating his expanding business empire. Not only did he have his flagship club, but he also had six satellite locations across the city, all thriving to the point where franchising seemed plausible. Wait, wager all of that against your house and all this fancy electronic equipment? Are you insane? No, my house and equipment aren't up for grabs. You're betting against this recording and all its copies. You're betting against imprisonment and the loss of all your assets in civil court. You're risking your businesses, your real estate. A tense silence filled the room as Steve realized he could be fighting for his freedom. In your cars, Kyle added. Steve owned a collection of vintage and modern Corvettes, one representing each decade since the 1950s. They were his pride and joy, well known throughout the town. This heightened the stakes significantly, but Steve dismissed Kyle's capabilities. Done in the cabin by the lake. Fine, fine, Steve said. Seems you hold all the cards. I'll risk everything, though honestly, there's no risk. I'll beat you. Kyle glanced at Jenny. She had heard him outline the terms to Steve and was now preparing herself for her own gamble. If I win, I get everything. You walk away without contesting the divorce, forfeit any claim on our home or cottage, and won't touch a cent from our bank accounts or investments. You also have to witness every moment of the fight, plus you'll live with Steve until the bout and if I win, for a whole year after. Jenny trembled, yet she nodded in consent. She recognized Steve's strength but was equally aware of Kyle's fitness and his regular running routine. She had witnessed him effortlessly handle reels of cable and long pipes backstage, tasks that usually required two people. Kyle met her gaze with his usual blank expression, leaving her uneasy at not being able to discern his thoughts what if. I prefer to place my bet on you. You've already made your decision last week, this week, your choice is between freedom and jail. Fade to black. The weeks flew by during which Kyle focused on rebuilding his strength. He gradually resumed taking on lighting projects, and his return was greeted with widespread approval. Despite lingering curiosity about his recent ordeal, Kyle consistently deflected questions about the attack. Speculation about his wife, G, fueled a constant stream of rumors. It was widely known she now lived with Steve, prompting speculation about Kyle's next move. Known for his tenacity, few believed he would quietly endure the humiliation. The night of the confrontation arrived. Kyle entered the gym dressed simply in a t-shirt and sweatpants. Steve, already at the ring, sported flashy boxing shorts and a muscle shirt adorned with the gym's logo. G sat at a table, clutching an envelope containing Steve's titles and contracts, a tangible reminder of the stakes. Surrounded by his supporters, Steve basked in their encouragement and taunts about the impending easy fight. Their teasing intensified as Kyle entered. With his slender runner physique, he seemed no match for Steve's muscular bulk. Ignoring G, Kyle placed his folder of contracts and recordings on the table beside Steve's before climbing into the ring. Let's do this. No bells, no refs, no stopping until one of us gives up, he declared. Steve smiled and lumbered towards the ropes, climbed through them, and extended his hand to Kyle. Kyle glanced at it and then threw a jab at Steve's nose without taking it. Steve looked up, shocked, as blood trickled from his nostril. No mercy, Kyle exclaimed, landing another punch. Steve's imposing physique was impressive, but his lack of agility was evident compared to Kyle's nimble movements. Steve struggled to react swiftly, his rigid form hindering him as Kyle darted around effortlessly. 
despite Steve's efforts to corner Kyle, he couldn't match Kyle's speed, repeatedly eating jabs to the face. Before long, Steve's face was swollen, and his pursuit slowed. Steve soon realized he wasn't faring any better in the center of the ring. Despite Kyle's smaller stature, his reach advantage and relentless pace wore Steve down. As Steve tired from swinging wildly, Kyle began targeting his body, gradually breaking him down. Steve's fatigue showed as his defenses weakened. Give it up, Steve. You can barely stand, you're defenseless. It's over for you, Kyle said. Steve, his breath ragged, gazed upward. His eyes were swollen, blood seeping from his nose and a deep gash under the one eye that remained open. Give up now and I'll spare you more than you deserve. Apologize publicly, do it now, and I'll take just the gym, the building, and the 58 convertible. You can keep the rest. If you resist, I'll knock you out and take everything. Steve knew he had lost. His head drooped as his body sank to its knees. I apologize, he said. Kyle walked to the table, retrieving the deeds to the building, the gym, and the 58 vet. Keys in hand, he faced Steve's disbelieving friends and associates. I'll be shutting down the gym and opening a theater school here. I'll honor your employment contracts, but expect you to work for me in new roles. If he relocates you to another gym, I'll release you from your obligations here. For the building's tenants, I'll honor your leases and negotiate fairly upon renewal. However, this space will transform into a theater, changing its atmosphere. If you wish to terminate your leases due to this change, I'll release you from them. G looked at Kyle with disbelief. For so long, they had both shared the aspiration of creating a community for theater professionals and enthusiasts aimed at advancing the art of theater. Now he was bringing their dream to life without her, using the resources gained from her betrayal. She felt completely excluded, suddenly overwhelmed by loneliness and a chilling emptiness. Her face drained of color as she gazed at Steve, who appeared utterly defeated. His face, already lacking pigment, was now marred with bruises and streaked with blood from fresh cuts that his friends were carefully tending to. Steve had never seemed so pathetic, so shattered. Kyle, on the other hand, had never seemed so resolute. There was no hint of triumph or conceit, only a calm assurance that marked everything he did. Fade to black. Six months later, G still resided with Steve. Neither of them had felt any attraction to each other since their quarrel, however, they were bound to live together due to their agreement. It was a detached coexistence, each blaming the other for their respective misfortunes. G had swiftly and quietly moved out of her former home, which now belonged entirely to Kyle following their divorce. Kyle hadn't communicated with her since their fight, ignoring her attempts to reach out. Meanwhile, Steve had focused on sustaining his business, but growth had slowed due to his reputation being tarnished after the incident. He was economizing by offering memberships tailored for older individuals and stay-at-home moms. Two of his satellite gyms had closed, and the rest had lost their allure. Losing his penthouse when Kyle gained ownership of his building forced Steve into a modest condo near one of his remaining gyms, now his main location. His once confident swagger had waned, often disappearing altogether. Instead of exuding assurance as he once did, he now appeared noticeably less formidable. His mood frequently soured, consumed by financial worries since he no longer received rent from his downtown property to support his other ventures. Kyle had successfully transformed the main gym into a magnificent theater space. He had also repurposed smaller areas into rehearsal spaces, workshops, and dressing rooms. In addition, he had created an intimate cabaret theater and opened a coffee house with a small stage on the first floor. A summer season was already planned, generating excitement throughout the town about the opportunities Kyle was presenting for actors and audiences of all ages. Despite his busy focus on setting everything up, it seemed as though Kyle had almost forgotten about the attack less than a year ago. However, he couldn't shake the memories. Every night when he returned home and every time he entered a theater where he and G had once worked together, the memories flooded back. Despite his efforts, he couldn't escape the recollections of their shared past and the woman he had once believed to be the love of his life. 
One night, while working on a lighting design in his studio at home, Kyle was interrupted by the doorbell. It was Jeannie's brother Peter, who rarely ventured outside of Boston and had only visited G a couple of times during her relationship with Kyle. His unexpected presence hinted at something serious. Hi, Kyle. I'm sorry to bother you, but I really need to talk about my sister. Could I come in? Peter asked urgently. Sensing the gravity of the situation, Kyle stepped aside and invited Peter into the living room. He offered him coffee or a beer, but Peter declined. I really want to address why I came here. I'm truly sorry things turned out so poorly between you two. I always thought you were a great couple, and our entire family was shocked by my sister's sudden change of heart. She's committed to fulfilling her part of the agreement. She realizes now it was foolish to choose a fling over you, but her life with Steve isn't what she expected. She picked Steve over me, Kyle muttered. Seems fair. She gets what she wanted. She chose a fling. She was wrong and hurt you deeply, and no one blames you for your reaction. She was foolish, but living with Steve is unbearable. Now it's turned physical. He hit her and broke her nose last night. Kyle grimaced at the news of Jeannie's abuse. He wanted her to suffer through Steve's idiocy, his tacky American jock decor, his life as a full-time gym rat. He wanted her disgusted by Steve's sexist remarks and expectations, his selfishness, his endless vanity. Take me to her, he told Peter. She's in the car. She refused to come in. She's too proud and didn't want me to come in, and she's really angry. I just want you to release her from the promise to spend a whole year with Steve. She doesn't want that either, but I'm afraid next time he'll hurt her worse. Kyle stood up slowly and headed for the door, Peter following closely. Please be gentle with her, Kyle. She's been through hell, even if she brought some of it on herself. Kyle approached the car and opened the door. Please come inside, he said to Jeannie. We need to talk. Jeannie hesitated but eventually stepped out of the car. She began walking toward the house, and Kyle whispered to Peter, she'll be okay. Go to Steve's, get her things, and bring them here. Kyle guided Jeannie into the kitchen. A rush of memories flooded her mind. Nothing had changed, it smelled the same, looked the same, felt like home. Yet her photographs were all gone, replaced by pictures of Kyle's family. Tears welled up in her eyes. Being erased from her home in this manner was heartbreaking. This place had been hers, especially since she had settled into a new one, yet living with Steve had become unbearable. She hadn't been replaced, just erased from a place she once cherished. Kyle noticed her tears but didn't approach her, despite his deep feelings for the woman who remained the love of his life. Instead, he made her a cup of coffee just the way she liked it, better than anyone else, even Jeannie herself. The aroma of the hot brew and its perfect taste brought her back to herself, yet also reminded her of the perfect husband and wife she had walked away from. You're leaving Steve's place. Peter is picking up your belongings now. You'll move in here. You can stay in the small apartment we built above the garage. You'll have your independence. Once you're back on your feet and working again, you can move out whenever you're ready. If you want, I can find you a job at my new shop. If you choose not to leave, you're welcome to stay as long as you want. I don't want to see any romantic activity, although I may bring dates home myself. I expect you to take care of your apartment, respect my property, and be considerate to our neighbors and guests. These are the only conditions of living here. There won't be any rent. There are no expectations or promises other than mutual respect. Somewhere inside me, I will always love you, but I also harbor fear about what might have caused you to betray me as you did. I didn't want you to endure abuse from Steve, so I don't expect you to stay with him for the rest of the year. She held back tears and, for the first time in months, looked into Kyle's eyes. She thanked him amidst sobs, mentioning something about living with Peter, but Kyle reminded. She knew that New York's theater scene was her life and that she wouldn't stay away for long. Knowing he was right, she agreed to move in. Wait here, I'll help Peter. Make yourself comfortable. His final words filled her with relief. 
fade to black. Kyle parked his car behind Peter and strode into Steve's house with an air of ownership. Steve, though uncomfortable with Kyle's assertiveness, found himself unable to object. Having assaulted Jeannie, Steve now faced her brother and the man who had publicly humiliated him either of whom could report him for abuse. Peter leveraged this threat like a tyrant. Steve carried Jeannie's belongings to the car, Peter had assisted with packing, but Steve insisted on carrying them himself. There wasn't much, as the divorce settlement had left Jeannie with only a few mementos in her clothes. After his final trip inside, Steve prepared to speak. Don't say a word. Kyle's voice was stern. You know what comes next, don't you? Steve dreaded hearing it. You broke her nose. You hit a defenseless woman and disfigured her face. Steve stood up and met Kyle's gaze without protest. Kyle also stood closing the distance between them. Before Steve or Peter could anticipate his next move, Kyle swiftly broke Steve's nose with a powerful punch. Fade to black. Three years later, Jeannie continues to reside in Kyle's in-law apartment. She has abstained from dating but is contemplating giving it another try. At Kyle's theater center, she is highly esteemed, serving as a stage manager, director, and teacher. She views Kyle not only as her closest friend, but also as a respected mentor. Her play, which she authored, has found success in regional theaters and has been published by a major publishing house, achieving financial independence. She is beginning to resemble the genie of old. Kyle's decision to welcome Jeannie back into his life was interpreted as a positive signal by his neighbors, family, and the theater community. She was reintegrated into these circles with nearly the same level of respect she had enjoyed before, despite no one forgetting where she had been. Steve, devastated by himself and his businesses, went through a period of introspection and realized he didn't like the person he had become. He put his college degree in physical education to good use by securing a position at a local elementary school. He developed a fondness for working with children facing physical challenges and other special needs. Steve has since become a coach for the Special Olympics and volunteers in the physical therapy department of a nearby children's hospital. Kyle's theater project flourished, and his programs earned accreditation from a local university. His educational programs for schoolchildren are highly esteemed and lucrative. His professional productions consistently draw capacity crowds and have garnered attention from top critics in New York who typically focus on Broadway venues. Kyle and Jeannie lived in close proximity but seldom communicated. Despite Kyle helping her in times of need, he did so out of a sense of duty. Jeannie had once been the love of his life, and he couldn't bear to see her completely ruined and ostracized by the community she had dedicated herself to. Once he ensured her safety, he desired nothing more from her professionally. He interacted with her because of her invaluable expertise to his company. However, he couldn't envision her in any other role and rarely engaged with her on a personal level. Jeannie viewed her place in Kyle's life as a gift. She wasn't incarcerated, had a job, and could somewhat reconcile with Kyle being near him without hope of. Her love seemed once again to be the preferable choice over any other outcomes. She realized she couldn't fully make amends but maybe remaining nearby until she saw him find happiness with someone new and perhaps start a family would bring her some peace. It was inevitable. Kyle fell for a divorced woman he met at the Cape. She spent her summers in a nearby cottage with her brother's family and her young daughter. By fall, she had moved in with Kyle, and they had a small, beautiful wedding in his backyard that October. G had declined the invitation but watched the ceremony from her bedroom window, the only place with a clear view. Bitter tears streamed down her face as she reflected on the events leading to this moment, her tears falling onto her final suitcase. The rest had already been packed into the rental car in the garage. As the celebration moved indoors for dinner, G grabbed her bag and got into her car. She took one last look at Kyle's house before driving away, knowing he would find the farewell letter she left on his desk when he returned from his honeymoon. She checked her carry-on one last time to make sure she had her ticket, passport, and signed contract for her new job as a stage manager in London. Kyle had begun his new life, and now it was her turn to start hers, shedding one final tear as she drove away.